Hello, there we are again. Um, thank you for joining, for those who joined for the first time this morning. Um, good morning. Uh, what I uh, wanted to say before we start is, is just to mention that the other moderator, Amy Perrin-Ross, is joining from the States and we she joined at 1.30 in the morning, so I want to thank her for that. I mean, it's, uh, I, I hope she's taking some rest um, as we talk, but um, I would like to introduce the, the next session now. <clears throat> the topic of this session concerns the, the impact of the COVID-19. Uh, it's a subject already addressed by our keynote speaker, Mrs. Koneshna, uh, who will um, speak as, as, as a panel member later in the session. We will discuss the challenges for persons with MS and identify best practices. We, we have been facing, as you all know, an excessive political and scientific COVID communication and fake news period for more than 15 months now. Today, we are invited to listen to a panel composed of a patient, a nurse, a neurologist, and a policymaker, and ask them to answer, in fact, uh, three questions, but obviously uh, we can address more questions, and you will be invited to join your questions to, the, to these three questions later on. First question is, how would you describe the best, the biggest challenge in your area of concern during this ongoing COVID period? The second question is, what best practices did you identify during this period? And the third question is, what were, in your opinion, the best solutions proposed, but not only proposed, but also implemented? So, to address these topics or these three questions, uh, we have a panel and the panel is composed of four people. Uh, first, we will have Pete Aland. Pete Aland is a clinical nurse specialist working for more than 30 years in the National MS Center of Melsbrook in Belgium. Um, besides his clinical practice, he organizes educations and participates in research. Since uh, 2021, he is president of the Belgian Association of MS Nurses. Since 2017, he is a board member of RIMS. And since last year, he joined, joined the MS Nurse Pro Syllabus Committee of EMSP. Then we will have Susanna Van Tonda who is originated from South Africa, but she's a member of the board of MS Society of Luxembourg. She's an activist and experienced leader in the MS community, and she will share her perspective and give us insight into what the past year has been like for young people with MS. Then we will have uh, Dr. Giampaolo Brichetto, um, he has, uh, besides many academic achievements, a PhD in neurosciences. He is currently coordinator of research in rehabilitation for the Italian MS Society and its foundation. He's head of rehabilitation service for the Italian MS Society and vice president of rehabilitation in MS Network RIMS. And finally, we will have the comments of MEP, Mrs. Konezna from Poland, who, for those who did not attend uh, the presentation of Mrs. Konezna uh, earlier in today's session, she's an MEP, um, member of the European Parliament, and a great ally and supporter of the work of EMSP. So I will now um, leave the floor for a tour de table with the, the panelists and give the floor to Mr. Pete Aylin. Pete, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, uh, Sharla, for your kind introduction, and uh, thank you, EMSP, for the opportunity to, to talk about uh, these challenges and uh, our best practices. I think um, one of the challenges um, came just along when it all started a, more than a year ago. It was quite new for, for everybody, um, and it frightened of course, every person every person in the in the society but also every healthcare professional of course and um, the, the, the guides the guidelines that we received changed nearly from day to day and so it was quite um, challenging for for our for our management um, to give the, the correct uh, answers to to lots of questions and and to give the the, the good guidelines um, together with that, we had a fear of the losing personnel or sort of dropping out of, of the staff. And, and uh, so our biggest challenge in the beginning was keeping up with the latest news and, and adapting our guidelines and adapting them specific for our rehabilitation center. So we trained the whole staff in how to uh, proceed and how to work in, in, in the best circumstances. It's not uh, easy for, for a nurse or a doctor, it's maybe more uh, convenient to dress with uh, uh, gloves and masks and, and uh, um, all those protection uh, material. But for a physiotherapist or especially for a social worker, it's completely new. But so we have to learn and, and train our staff how to um, adapt those guidelines in our practice. Um, another uh, another uh, challenge maybe was um, safety, keeping safety, so adapting the national guidelines. And, and, and that's why we closed our outdoor rehabilitation center and our indoor rehabilitation center was quite reduced. Together with that, our consultations that we did in our rehab center we nearly, um, they, well, they, they nearly stopped. But this was a quite a good thing. At that moment, we had a, a study just started on the effect of teleconsultation, and it really received a boost uh, due to this uh, problem. Uh, the hospital was quite closed, and the persons with MS, they were feared to come to a hospital because if there is COVID, I will, I will get the COVID from you, from the hospital. Um, and that we uh, elaborated um, those teleconsultations. Another thing was testing our, our staff because we want to keep out the COVID of our rehabilitation center. So on a regular basis, all the staff and afterwards also the patients had to be tested. Um, and then later on, or the second vague, and then we tried to, to do more because we felt that it was quite important for having contact with our persons with MS, with our patients, and encourage them to stay active. Um, not only physical active, but also mentally uh, active. So we had to give them a physical and a mental support by teleconsultation or by seeing them uh, uh, Still on, still going on, or we we are building the the consultations. And then from the beginning of this year, I think that when we started the vaccinations, it's something that uh, gets our special attention also because uh, lots of our persons they take disease modifying therapies, and then we have to have the right uh, guidelines of um, yeah. Um, when can we give a vaccination? Are you eager to get a vaccination? Do, do the patient want a vaccination and support them in the vaccination on the right moment? Uh, and the, the different disease modifying therapy they, they have. Well, I think this is in, in, in a nutshell all the challenges that we uh, occurred in our center. But later on, we can uh, still come back on that. Okay, Charlotte? Uh, This was a very good uh, kickoff of, of this session and very realistic and, uh, and interesting remarks. Um, I leave the floor to Susanna Van Tonde now. Susanna? Mm. 
Susanna? I had a connection problem. I think uh, every conference has them. Uh, so, um, as you know, I'm a young patient with MS, and uh, as such, it is a quite. It was quite difficult at the beginning, as Pete also identified. We did not really have information, and COVID took us by surprise in a certain sense. Um, there was a lot of anxiety within the patient community as well. What are we going to do now? How are things going to go from this point on? Um, is this really the way a thing should be? How are we going to access our medication, our treatment and even work as, as such? Even if we think about the social isolation that occurred in the beginning where we didn't have access to our friends and family, the support networks, which we actually really do need in such um, difficult times. So what actually what we did also um, in the Young People's Network and in uh, Multiple Sclerosis uh, Luxembourg is we identified these issues and uh, tried to solve them in the best way possible. In terms of uh, community, um, the Young People's Network created this project called the MS COVID Squad, which organized um, monthly meetups, even earlier at the beginning, um, to bring together the community, the European community of young MSers. And so to avoid the struggles we had, we had different topics we covered as well. Um, what we did um, apply as well and in, um, in terms of the lack of communication and of information, um, Multiple Sclerosis Luxembourg um, shared an, a special edition of their magazine containing all the information about COVID, which we had at that point in time. So that was really great because if you uh, or a patient and you sit in this specific situation and you do not really know where to go from there it was really compact really well done and i felt that many ha were happy that they had this um resource that was given to them also with the meetups for the young people's network um in terms of um treatment we had the teleconsultation that was also mentioned by pete that was really beneficial because as he also stated many patients are afraid to go to the hospital afraid of catching covid in a very dire circumstance so for when it po was possible teleconsultations were used and i think this is something that it will stay because it also allowed for access to to um, doctors, even if you're from a remote location and as such. And uh, the thing which I really, really appreciated was the implementation of remote work. I know that's not possible everywhere, but as a person with MS taking a disease modifying medication, that was a really, really good start, even uh, if we think about fatigue that impacts us. So, in a certain sense, um, COVID really dr has driven that forward, and I feel that will be beneficial on long term as well. So, I think that was everything from my point. Thank you, Susanna. That's great. It's um, it shows that uh, when you react uh, and when you are being empowered, then we'll come back to that. I think it's uh, it's. Or when you empower people, it's uh, you 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 get a number of solutions coming up, and we'll certainly come back to that. Um, I will now turn to Dr. Brichetto. Um, Dr. Brichetto, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you for the nice introduction, and also for the invitation, of course. Uh, my role during the pandemic was uh, to be the, the head of the, as today, the rehabilitation services in Italy for Italian MS Society. And um, when uh, everything started, of course, uh, the mm, information 
also that they were delivered to, to healthcare professionals were, were uh, a lot, but also misleading in the sense that uh, it was not easy to understand how it was possible to um, uh, contain the pandemic and also maintain rehabilitation services. In particular, I can speak about the Italian experience, but uh, we can enlarge this experience also to Europe because uh, we have also studied uh, what has happened in Europe during the pandemic uh, period uh, with a dedicated questionnaire uh, within the RIMS community. And so the first uh, uh, thing that uh, we uh, started uh, to do was to um, uh, try to be in contact with a uh, uh, person with multiple sclerosis that were followed by our centers. Uh, we are talking about uh, more or less 3,000 people with multiple sclerosis. So we started a sort of uh, low-cost uh, teleconsultation and uh, uh, all healthcare professionals provided information through uh, emails, chat or phone calls every day to um, people with a message that were followed by our centers. In the meantime, the uh, other issue was to, uh, there was a shortage of, uh, in particular in Italy, of uh, personal prote protective equipment. So in order to uh, have the possibility to deliver uh, rehabilitation to people with MS, uh, the first thing, the second thing that we, we, we started to do was to uh, identify uh, providers of uh, personal uh, protective equipment uh, in order to be as safe as possible. And then every, and then after uh, one week or 10 days, more or less, uh, the uh, emergency uh, start that in Italy was the 8th of March, 2020, uh, we restarted our rehabilitation activities as outpatient service uh, and also for in-home rehabilitation activities for uh, the uh, people with MS that were followed and considered urgent from a clinical point of view. And of course, this was uh, really appreciated by uh, people with MS that uh, are uh, in contact with the uh, Rehabilitation Center of Italian MS Society. Because one of the aspects that was, uh, uh, in my opinion, a, a, an issue during the, 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 the March and April 2020 was that uh, um, different uh, hospital in Italy, but also in Europe, were closed or converted to COVID-19 activities. And uh, this was, uh, um, this led to um, an important issue, the interruption of rehabilitation services that are considered for people with MS a, a therapeutic area. So uh, this was a, a, an emergency into the real emergency of the pandemic. And I think that uh, when we have to think about the future, we have to think uh, how we can um, reschedule or transform our organizational model in order to deliver uh, what it is necessary also in uh, when uh, there is an emergency like a pandemic. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Brichetto. I think that was, uh, we have now sufficient food to, to fill up the forthcoming two days. Um, I, I think um, I'd like to, to have a few uh, comments and I invite obviously the the audience um, from all over the place to react to, to these presentations, but uh, I'd like you to uh, 
uh, interact between the four of you. Uh, what I've noted is um, that there is uncertainty has certainly resulted in uh, in an initial confusion. Uh, that's that's quite clear. And um, so the the immediate need to empower uh, persons with MS maybe was not there in the very beginning. And um, there is also the, the fright of going to the hospital and the appreciation of remote working possibility, um, which might provide opportunities for persons with MS. So with, with these questions, I would like to introduce and give the floor to the last panel member, Mrs. Koneshna, how does this resound in your ears? The floor is yours. We do not have your mic. You hear me? Yes. Great, great. So uh, uh, it's a little bit tricky because I sitting in a European Parliament building in Strasbourg and the worst connection in the Europe is in a European Parliament. That's so sorry <laughs> if uh, you if there will be some troubles, but it's uh, uh, without me and uh, I'm happy that I want to be here with you today and thank you very much for once again for invitating me. Uh, to the conference. Unfortunately, a uh, plenary session is underway. Uh, we voting very important things here these days. Uh, for example, the abolition of a patent protection for vaccines and so on. That, that's the reason why I'm here uh, with you only now and I, it was impossible for me to before so but once more, thank you very much for, for your appreciate that I can still be uh, at least with you for a while. Uh, so, about your question, yeah, I'm thinking about the challenges because I need to say that, uh, as I know the people with uh, multiple scler sclerosis, uh, and as I know my own experience, I think that uh, we like challenges. That means that uh, multiple sclerosis itself is a challenge and uh, we can live with them and i think we have all mastered it uh, in the end yeah that means that for us it was a challenges but in the other side we are preparing for this uh, because the life with multiple sclerosis is sometimes a challenge uh, especially for me in the morning if i wake up uh, and uh, uh, but but uh, uh, but uh, the, the political view uh, if I could say, uh, the biggest challenge was that, uh, as, as some doctors uh, tell you before, uh, we suddenly couldn't, couldn't communicate with the doctors, uh, other patients, caregivers. Uh, I think it was something new, yeah, that nobody knows what can do. And uh, we had to quickly find a new way to communicate and inform, but in the other side, I think that the electronic communication was uh, and still is for somebody the biggest challenge and it stays after half, uh, one and a half year and uh, of course there were a lot of other problems uh, for example we had to rethink the rules regarding the approval of the vaccine uh, to uh, set up uh, the process or one of the biggest uh, one from the point of view of the cooperation on the EU levels was the purchase of the vaccine on the EU levels through the joint procurements. This was for us a survey by combat, uh, I would say, and yes, everybody theoretically knew about it, but in practically nobody tried uh, before COVID. We very often discuss in the European Parliament last six years about what could happen and everybody knows that some pandemic coming because the experts tell us and I was with um, very strong contact with the experts from ECDC and then tell us very often, okay, be prepared. 
but uh, it's as as uh, with the uh, with something else. Yeah, if not coming, uh, you theoretically know what you can do, but the practice is another. But I hope that we uh, doing not all good, but uh, we doing what we can, and we uh, we find a, a good way, a good way uh, in the end, and uh, the situation after COVID will be better. But if if I could speak about those uh, about the challenges for politicians, it was another. Uh, but the same sometimes as uh, challenges for patients with multiple sclerosis, yeah, because we stay in the same line. Yeah, we need to new communication. We need to um, find solutions in another way than it was before, and so on and so on. That's 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 my point of view on it. Thank you very much, um, Mrs. Konechner, for sharing your experience of this uh, of the crisis um, and and its consequences I, I, I'd like to um, leave a couple of questions for um, dr. Brichetto. Um it's been said that uh, we would might be see more teleconsultation um, in in the future um, how would you react to that and the other um question or statement that was made also um and maybe it's also for pete allen um is about the fright of going to the hospital i mean which is something maybe some people have all the time but it 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 raises question because it, it it's really been a, a major issue because people some people were contracting covid inside the hospital so um could you could you reflect on those two questions dr bricetto yeah thank you for the for the question for regarding the teleconsultation or more in general digital health uh, i believe that uh, Mm, that there is a need to uh, to improve digital health and teleconsultation. Uh, the, this was a need also before the pandemic, uh, in the sense that, uh, mm, in particular for uh, mm, the area of rehabilitation, and uh, in my opinion, for people with uh, um, chronic diseases uh, if you want to improve uh, uh, your uh, knowledge of the disease the progression of the disease you need to uh, acquire let's say more data uh, so you have to improve the granularity of uh, uh, clinical information coming from people with the chronic disease, people from multiple sclerosis, and I think that the only way that uh, can can help in this uh, uh, improvement uh, will be teleconsultation and digital health. Now we have discovered also in the pandemic era that uh, this is needed because uh, uh, people um, had problems in simply in transportation for example or, or, or fear in uh, moving to the hospital so this this, this is uh, really needed now and uh, this is connected uh, in my opinion to uh, the um, organizational model of uh, uh, the delivery of some therapeutic uh, treatments like rehabilitation because of course uh, in particular for the case of uh, italy i can speak now um, and in particular for the rehabilitation centers uh, that are uh, ruled by the Italian MS Society. Of course, uh, the, if a, a rehabilitation center is within an hospital, if the hospital is converting into a COVID-19 hospital or um, is not converted, but there is a fear to go to the hospital for uh, the fear of being infected, of course, you need to have a distributed um, 
and uh, in some sort uh, redundant uh, model of rehabilitation services that are mainly uh, in the setting of outpatient service. Uh, this uh, will lower the fear to go to the hospital, of course, because uh, we will have dedicated uh, centers that uh, will be uh, in some sort, uh, in some way, uh, more safe than an hospital. And uh, I think that this is a, a reflection that we have to, to make uh, as also um, in our role of leading the organization of uh, rehabilitation centers. Thank you. Um, Pete Allen, how would you react to, the, to what Dr. Brichetto just said? Does that yeah. reflect? Go ahead. Yeah, I think I can agree, of course. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's nice. We always talk about telemedicine, but of course, digital health is a better overarching term, I think. It's not only tele uh, consultation, it's also uh, like tele rehabilitation or tele empowerment nearly, uh, because we feel that the patient needs us. And then this, this path of tele or digital health is really a new tool that we have uh, uh, continue to use. Um, and concerning the, the fear of going to a hospital, of course, there were so many outbreaks um, especially in um, elderly people homes um, and I think the, the thing that is really crucial is the knowledge about hygiene and the personal uh, protective equipment or personal protective measurements that we have to take and if we are supported by our hospital hygienists or hygiene services and uh, everybody is trained on the correct way I think we have to say that even in the hospital, it's, uh, it's, it's more secure than outside of the hospital. Because if you're going to the supermarket or to the, the store, then the chance of uh, being infected is probably even higher or bigger than inside of a hospital or a rehabilitation center. So this is something that we have to take into account also, I think. So the, the training of the staff and the, the personal protective equipment has to be uh, maintained and, uh, and used. Thank you, Pete. Um, <clears throat> we, we will not discuss the, the, the vaccine issue because it comes up later in the, in the program, uh, I think, tomorrow. So um, we are not going to address that. Thank you very much, uh, Pete. Uh, need to empower. Um, and, and um, persons with MS like challenges. How do you like that, Susanna? I personally like that quite a lot <laughs> because um, as patients and especially in my work as a patient advocate, it's so important to know that we as patients have an influence on our disease and on the way it will develop. Um, for example, um, digital tools, I held an, um, a, a talk about this two years ago at the MSP's conference. And digital health was a big um, theme and topic already there. So as patients, we should use and be able to use and also be supported in the use of digital tools for our health management, be it um, in terms of uh, getting our symptoms um, noted down, um, even journaling. And um, this is so, oh, I, I love it when my brain does this with MS. I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's no problem. That, that happens with me all the time. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's nothing, quite nothing specific. Sure. Yeah. Um, but but uh, I think it's it's extremely important. But do you, uh, without going to a too personal question, um, do you do you like teleconsultation? To be honest. Well, it depends on um, on why it's delivered and how. 
Uh, for example, when I uh, speak to my doctors and it's something that's really urgent and needs to be looked at, that's good if we can call them or if they can call us and we can speak about it and then we can look at further measures. Not everything needs an in-personal uh, consultation, although that's clearly advised if the situation uh, is needed. For example, if um, my neurologist uh, has to check if my um, reflexes are working, that's not something that's so easily done over uh, via teleconsultation or digital health. But if it's something where we can talk about, for example, if I can explain that my um, concentration issues or, or um, memory has been fluctuating, that's something I can tell them via teleconsultation. And that's something we can talk about and um, actually see how we're going to proceed from that point. Um, I feel that if we have access to it, I don't think that it should be the sole method of uh, continuing the patient and uh, um, physician's relationship and partnership over a long time. But I do believe that in uh, cases of urgency where we need to talk and we need to see each other in terms of, um, for example, my MRI is coming up and we need to discuss the latter, it would be great if we could also do it like that. And I, uh, for example, I have to go to the hospital and the hospital is quite far away from me. So if it's only a discussion, nothing too personal, nothing where there's really a need for a physical examination, I do believe that that could be a great, great opportunity if we develop that further. However, yeah. that being said, I don't think that we should leave the personal consultations aside because it is different if we see somebody in person or if we only speak to them uh, via Zoom or uh, via via telephone. It's a totally different experience. And I, for example, I don't think patients who meet their doctor for the first time should really do it via a uh, via teleconsultation because if we meet somebody for the first time we have to have this feeling about how do i feel about this person can this person provide adequate care and i feel that if we meet somebody on a personal level and in person we have a different um emotional relation to that person or feeling about how our patient relationship to to say that I have if does that make sense? Yeah, not uh, who am I to say that what you say <laughs> doesn't make sense? No, it makes a lot of sense to me. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm just wondering, would you call would you call your nurse or would you, would you prefer to have your your therapist, your I mean your medical doctor? to address your questions or does the I have two questions in there uh, or would you call the nurse to get access to your doctor because it, doctors are not always um, they're so busy um, they're not always accessible so how would you do well um it's very special the case in luxembourg we don't have a a lot of MS nurses, in fact, I know of one who specialized um, in one of the hospitals and who actually takes care of MS patients, but I am not in treatment with them. So it's a very difficult, uh, not difficult, but different situation. But that being but you said, have social um, workers. Or, um, I don't have social workers. No, me personally, I no. don't. But that being said, I want to say is that um, our MS Society in Luxembourg, we are actually working towards having uh, the MS nurses actually be more active. We have uh, had one person in training so that um, in the future, people can also call us and have somebody who's knowledgeable and who can provide further information because in the um, in our MS society we also have social workers who can guide the patients but for me as a person as a young person and in my particular situation i've not had uh, to uh, go back to those options but i am aware that other patients i know did that in fact 
did have contact with the MS nurse and um, the social workers in their hospital. Okay, thank you, Susanna. I have a question from uh, Jennifer Gerald. Um, is an MS person, person's level of fatigue affected by teleconsultation? Um, I, I guess I would turn to Dr. Brichetto and, and Pete Allen. Dr. Yeah. Brichetto? Yeah, of course, is uh, is uh, affected, as also uh, uh, direct and real interaction. But uh, I think that from the literature we can uh, see that the level of fatigue is affected because uh, using teleconsultation requires uh, uh, dual task uh, dual task activities that can that can influence the uh, cognitive and motor domain contemporary so of course a teleconsultation could be more fatiguing than a direct consultation thank you pete um, um I, I i can agree with Giampaolo, of course and um, i just want to make a small comment or an uh, and, and add on maybe to your previous question uh, concerning the the value of the teleconsultation and i think one important thing is that it has to be, of course, a personal contact. But I did quite a lot of teleconsultations, and always I followed up with the same patients every six weeks, every two months, every three months. And our contact really um, uh, was better after a few uh, teleconsultations. Of course, like uh, as already said, is that uh, the first consultation, of course, it has to be in real life, I think. So both situations has to stay together, I think, but for both situations, there is really an ad um, and teleconsultations really can um, improve our care for persons with illness. Thank you, Pete. Um, we are close to concluding this session. I would like to have Mr. Konechna's um, insight and experience and um, and drive because I like her drive very much. Um, are we going to learn at at European at uh, the European Parliament level from this COVID um, pandemic, and 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 then how could could we improve the cooperation? A short comment on that will help us to understand your point of view. So, <laughs> uh, it's it's a difficult question. I'm one from from uh, in in EP level definitely yes, and uh, as I said uh, in my speech uh, in the previous section, uh, we certainly need to push for greater integration uh, of uh, health and social policy of union uh, European level. This is uh, very often if we speak about the social or health issue, we heard only this in the hand of member states. Uh, I think that so EMSP uh, see us how important is cooperate uh, across the whole Europe, across the member states, across everybody. And uh, I think that uh, it's necessary starting crucial debate and I hope that in uh, Convent of European Union this debate start uh, that we need to give these two very important topics as a health and social issue uh, to, to European level because without this we stay in the same line as where we are and uh, for me, it's for example, is thank you very much for this debate about the teleconferences and uh, digimedicine and so on, because we so will discussing and expected that we will discussing uh, maybe in, we start this debate in the end of uh, this year uh, with uh, one uh, with one paper or what is what is they're preparing from commission side, but in the other side. Uh, the digimedicine is something what's coming and e health so coming but uh, it needs to be so about the responsibility from 
European life because we will discuss discussing epics only in with the members uh, here in this conference you will Belgium and from Czech Republic and these people will be have other possibilities how, how to contact with the doctor uh, medicine can use it and so on and what I want to tell you in the end and what I can that these okay. two, two big topics uh, will be in the European level and the all patients in the whole European Union will be having the same level of, of medicines and the same level of caries what we can do this this is and it's not only about the about the digimedicine or e-health it needs to be about many many things in uh, for, for what we need to do for patients okay we count on you <laughs> thank you very thank you very much for leaving this message with us we it's time for us to conclude i would like to uh, first ask our beloved drawer to uh, leave his um sketches on the screen thank you give us a 10 seconds to read them and to see them and to take a picture of them if that may be done okay great well now i, I would like to, uh, first of all to to thank our four um panel members uh pete allen susanna van tonder Dr. Gianpaolo Brichetto and last but not least MEP Mrs. Koneshna for their um, for sharing their thoughts with us. Uh, I think it was very useful. Uh, I, I just see that we had this morning 258 attendees. Maybe some of them are at lunch right now. Uh, you're going to do the same. I invite you to go to lunch, but. Um, First, um, let me remind you that we have uh, opportunities for networking, uh, for visiting the exhibition, and to uh, look, have a look at the posters. So you know how to deal with that. So we will be back uh, for the next session um, at, um, let me see, at uh, 2 o'clock. Two o'clock sharp, we will see you for um, a session on MS Care in the digital age. Bon appétit. Enjoy your lunch. See you later. Bye-bye. Hello and welcome to the Roche Symposium. My name is Björn Tackenberg and I'm a neurologist and neuroimmunologist by training and I'm working for Roche. Today we want to talk about the importance of setting long-term goals in MS disease management and the role disease progression plays in it. Before we start, I would like to ask you one question. Where do you see yourself in five to 10 years? I'm sure a lot of people have faced this question before. This is one of the standard questions in job interviews. But did your neurologist ever ask you that question in the context of multiple sclerosis? Talking about long-term goals in disease management and life potentially does not always feel like a priority for neurologists and people living with relapsing multiple sclerosis. Especially in the early phases of the disease, there seems to be a focus rather on controlling relapses only or helping with accepting the diagnosis. Fortunately, people living with multiple sclerosis have usually experienced little functional decline shortly after diagnosis. So it might be scary to think about how MS symptoms could worsen and disease progression might impact life in the future. Today, we are speaking to Candice and Sap, two young adults living with multiple sclerosis and they are sharing their experiences with forward planning 
and disease progression. When you were diagnosed at that time, did you discuss long-term goals and progression with your neurologist? My name is Candace. I'm 32 years old, uh, living in Toronto, and I have had MS since uh, around 2012. Um, when I was first diagnosed, I don't actually remember there being very much discussion about how, you know, long-term planning in relation to my MS was important. Um, kind of the scary things stick into my mind when I think back to that time. Um, like I was aware that there was a potential that in the future I would be required to use um, a cane or a walker or, um, you know, a wheelchair or something like that. So those kind of like scary things really stick out in my mind from that kind of first conversation. Um, and then there was also the question that came up really early on in my diagnosis about uh, whether or not I was planning to have a family and have children. Um, at the time, I was quite young, so that was not something I was thinking about. Um, but it is asked of me every time I meet with my neurologist. And I think the, the main reason is for, you know, recommending a treatment plan. Um, but again, for me, being asked that question, it really um, made my brain spiral a little bit into all of these kind of what ifs. Um, like, for example, if I was to decide to have children in the future, um, would I be able to be the mother that I've always wanted to be? Um, would my MS basically impact my ability to be a good mom? So that's something that, uh, that I remember thinking about a lot in the beginning of my diagnosis as well. My name is Sebastian. I'm 34 years old and I'm based in Barcelona, although I'm originally from Denmark. And uh, well, if I remember back at when I was diagnosed, I remember being very lost and just hearing from my neurologist that I had multiple sclerosis and being asked the question directly whether I wanted to take treatment or not. To which I responded, obviously, yes, I want to take treatment. And without further ado, the neurologist gave me the treatment and just considered it done. No further questions asked. Um, so I was a student at the time of diagnosis and I was a very successful student and I was about to graduate. So the first thing that started rushing through my mind was if having multiple sclerosis, if I was going to be able to, well, to live up to my self-imposed standards in my academic career. So meaning that if I was going to be able to carry on with a PhD career or not. So not having the answer to that right then and there, what I decided to do was simply to put my studies on hold for an entire semester while I sort of came to terms with the news and rediscovered myself. A few years after being diagnosed, has your view on long-term planning changed? Um, my views on long-term planning haven't changed that much, I would say. Um, I think with a disease like MS, where you really don't know what might happen in the future, it's a lot harder and almost scarier to plan for the future so far in advance. So for me personally, um, I try and live in the moment and plan, you know, small things that I can do in my daily life now that hopefully will have um, long-term impacts in assisting that, you know, that my MS does not progress um, in a negative way. So, you know, things like trying to get a good night's sleep, eating well, um, exercising, like those small changes that I can make in my day-to-day -day life, hopefully will have an impact in the future. Um, with my MS personally, I've been like almost lucky in a way that the severe relapses that I have experienced uh, since being diagnosed have been pretty spaced apart. Um, and I actually haven't had a really bad relapse in a few years now. Um, so I, you know, I feel good for the most part. I think my MS is not progressing at all. Um, but then when I go in for my annual checkup with my neurologist to review, you know, my most recent MRI results, most of the time, my neurologist is telling me that there's new activity appearing on my MRI, there's 
you know, new lesions or the existing lesions have grown, um, which is really surprising to me because like I said, I mean, I've been feeling fine. Um, so it's really interesting and almost, it's kind of difficult to grasp the fact that even though I may feel good and, you know, completely fine, my MS is in fact progressing behind the scenes, even though it's not outwardly noticeable to anyone around me or even myself at times. Um, so that thought is in the back of my head, um, but I really try not to let my MS kind of dictate my life in any way. It's by no means something that I think about every single day um, or I try not to anyways. Um, and I'm just, you know, trying to be positive and looking to tomorrow and hoping that I get there and then we'll figure out the next day from there kind of thing. I can say that it has changed radically because when I was first diagnosed, the diagnosis came with a very high number of lesions. So when I heard that, uh, to me, it was, it, was, it was almost like a death sentence. Like I saw myself being bound to a wheelchair a few years from then. So my immediate reaction to that was that I was going to have to live in the moment, that I was going to have to do everything that I wanted to do in order to not have the regret of not having done it before. So I took all my savings, spent them all, and went traveling to various places. Now, um, having been diagnosed for eight years now, my, my view on long-term planning has definitely changed, and I'm not as dramatic as I was at first, because I can say that I've become more confident with my MS and more confident with my treatment, that I know that by taking the medication prescribed to me by my neurologist, that I can keep my... MS sort of down, calm enough for me to be able to carry on a normal life and to keep aspiring to reaching further heights in the future in my career. So it's not so much that I plan for the future more than I make my decisions in the moment, being confident that there will be a future in which I will be able to stand by the decisions that I make today. And in order to be even more confident with those decisions, I make sure to keep a healthy lifestyle. I'm a yoga teacher as well, so I make sure to practice yoga, to teach myself classes of yoga and um, working out and following a healthy diet and a healthy sleeping pattern. What did you wish you had known when you were diagnosed? For me, I think one of the scariest things about living with MS is not knowing what the future could bring to you. But for me, I think that remembering that whether you have MS or not, that's the same for everybody. Those feelings of uncertainty about your future are, you know, felt by every single person that is, you know, working at something or living. So you're not that alone in being unsure about your future or planning for your future. Um, it's, it's kind of a, a universal feeling being afraid of the future. So um, just focus on the now, be positive and do things to make your everyday life as, as fulfilling as possible. When you get diagnosed with MS, it might feel like a huge weight and a life-changing event, and it is. However, this life-changing event, um, you can also turn it into something positive. Um, you may discover on the other side of this, someone new, and this new person that you discover is actually gonna turn out to be a very strong and a fighter of a person. So welcome this new person into your life, uh, come to terms with it, become good friends with it. And this will help you along in your journey with MS. Thank you, Seb and Candice, for sharing your experiences. And of course, it is human nature that we all tend to primary focus on the here and now. There are some things that might have a beneficial impact and long lasting beneficial impact in the future. Especially when we are looking at the pathology of multiple sclerosis, we can see that from the very first beginning of the disease, 
there is a disease progression happening. And this is really hard to grasp as this doesn't become noticeable in a physical sense in any case, but we can detect underlying disease progression, immunological disease activity with the help of MRIs and biomarkers in the blood from the very first onset. Only later on in the course of multiple sclerosis, underlying disease progression can show as disability. The important message here is that it's really important to treat multiple sclerosis as early as possible and as effective as possible to make sure to minimize the impact the seemingly invisible changes from onset have on the future disease course. You, as people living with multiple sclerosis, can take an active role here. Listen to your body. Ask the questions, for example, am I able to walk as long as I used to a year ago? Am I as good in walking the stairs? Do I remember things as good as some time ago? And so forth. And please report the smallest changes you might detect to a neuro neurologist, especially when you experience change over time. This can be an indicator of disease progression. It must not be definitely a situation where you need to change treatment. It is not mandatory that it indicates a really severe stage of the disease, but discuss that with your neurologist and find a way for next steps to control the mass as effective as possible. In the next few minutes, I would like to share with you a couple of slides which are dealing with the difference between disease progression on the one side and disability progression on the other side. Multiple sclerosis is a disease that affects the central nervous system only. So that means brain and spinal cord. And the cause behind that affection is a disturbance in immune system functions. And as you can see on the left side, um, where a nerve fiber and a neuron are shown, plus the protective cover of these kind of neurons, the myelin, an immune cell is attacking the myelin and um, causes two things. The one is the protective sheath of an axon of a part of the nerve, of the neuron, is destroyed on the one side. The second effect is that a nerve information will be transported much slower. And at the end of the day, that leads malfunction of physical and mental integrity. And the way how physicians, how um, we in medical practice can make that visible for people living with multiple sclerosis is shown on the right side. Because that what we can see in M regular MRI brain scans is white spots. And these white spots are more or less the morphological correlate of that immune malfunction, inflammation and tissue damage process. What is now the difference between disability progression and disease progression? On the right side, you see that what we can measure in MRI scans, what we can make visible, uh, what happens in the brain tissue, and the same you can do with the spinal cord as well. And that is related to the disease itself, to the immunological malfunction, as I explained in, this, in the previous slide. On the left side, you can see how we can measure disability progression. And disability progression is usually measured by, for example, scores like the Expanded Disability Status Scale, EDSS, or other tests, the MSFC. Also questionnaires, uh, what we call pa patient-reported outcomes, are um, a good tool to measure disability progression. So that means the difference is that the disease progression refers to the immunological process behind and to the anatomical and morphological changes which one can make visible either in MRI scans or, for example, also in blood testing and biomarker testing. Disability progression 
In contrast to that, is that what one can see as a doctor in the physical examination? Or you can detect, once you are asking yourself, am I able to walk in that way that I was able one year ago, for example? Or is it possible that to, to, to step um, the stairs in a way which is more or less the same than one year or two years ago? How can disease progression be measured? The one opportunity is to measure it in the blood, and we call that biomarkers. So early indicators of disease progression can be detected in the blood already. This is not visible on MRI scans. This is only visible in the testing of blood in labs with machines, um, doing analysis on pro specific proteins in the blood or in the serum of a person living with multiple sclerosis. Another opportunity to make that visible is, as I said, the MRI scan. It visualizes the damage caused by MS, and we call that lesions or spots, white spots in specific sequences of the MRI. One really crucial thing to understand is that not every of these spots, not every of these lesions is causing visible or detectable symptoms. And the ratio is more or less 10 to 1. 10 lesions in the brain are necessary statistically that a person living with multiple sclerosis is experiencing a specific sign or symptom of the disease. And the third part or the third method to measure disease progression is the clinical measures. It's measuring the worsening of disability. Is that what a neurologist can detect when he or she is examination is, is doing a physical examination with you? Or once you are doing a test which um, is detecting um, insecurity or uh, ataxia, for example, in uh, the 9 pack test, for example, or others. One really crucial thing to control the disease progression and to control then at the end disability progression is to start early with a specific treatment. Because once one is stopping disease progression from the start, disease progression in very early stages of the disease, then one can experience a really good benefit for the outcome, for the long-term outcome of this progression, which is then translating in a vast expansion of disability progression as well. Thank you, Candice and Seb, for sharing your experience with us. And I want to ask all of you again, where do you see yourself in five to 10 years?